Welcome back. Let's now look at some of the issues that the Chancellor of the Exchequer raised and broaden that out to include India. I'm delighted now to welcome to the virtual stage the principal economic advisor to the government of India, Sanjeev Sanyal, who will say more about the global economy and what the UK and India can do together to grow wealth for, for everyone. So, Sanjeev, first of all, you've just heard the Chancellor of the Exchequer speak about how the UK has reacted to the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. From India's perspective, what do you think are the greatest challenges? Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, I just uh, listened to what uh, the Chancellor Kenneth was saying, and uh, there's a great deal of similarity in the way we uh, think about the world. Obviously, the world has gone through a major shock, um, but uh, as vaccines are uh, become more available. Um, I think uh, both the UK and uh, with the acceleration of vaccination here in India, I think uh, uh, we are being able to open up the economy quite uh, rapidly. Um, and despite disruptions caused by second wave very recently in India, I think uh, we are beginning to now see much of the economy coming back uh, quite, uh, quite uh, strongly, in fact. Um, but the point that you want to you raised is of how um, because India and the UK look at the world uh, and I would say even here uh, the relationship goes beyond just trade as Chancellor just pointed out um, it's about a wider view relating to um, geopolitical interest it relates to our shared values so I think the point here is that uh, as we go and look forward into a post-COVID world I think that is what we will be building on. It's just not about you know uh, responding to the here and now, which obviously we need to do. Uh, we you know we still need to build back our economies uh, uh, from the perspective of rebuilding it from the COVID shock. But I think there is a wider issue here of uh, creating all kinds of linkages. But of course, much of that will be uh, driven by trade relationships, especially uh, you know services trade, which obviously is important both. Um, India and to the UK. What lessons do you think have been learned? We'll get to the rest of our panel in just a moment. I think the big lesson that has been learned over the last one year is that what matters is to the flexible policy makers to what actually happened. Um, you know, you can know in theory that you know, pandemic can happen, so pandemics have happened throughout history. But when they actually happen, what really matters is reacting quickly to what happens, uh, being open to uh, watching uh, uh, the, the sequence of events are and um, being able to respond to them rather than having some idea that if only we had planned for so and so, eventuality we would have done better. You can never really plan for things because there's always going to be things that will happen in unexpected ways. I mean, we discovered it ourselves very recently when having beaten the first wave rather well and had the economy coming back quite strongly, we were hit by the second wave very, very quickly, disrupted our economies, but then, oddly enough, it also came off very, very sharply and we were able to open up our economies uh, now. But the point is that these are very much uh, lessons that what matters ultimately is resilience and flexibility uh, rather than having some grand plan about how the world will pan out to be. As they say, uh, you know, the, 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 the plans of mice and men. And women, of course. So when do you think we can get to India's growth to get to that fabled 8% and beyond? Actually, um, we are probably going to see close to double digit, if not double digit growth uh, in this financial year. Uh, that's um, 21, 22. Of course, one would one would argue that it, that is based on a somewhat uh, lower um, base coming off the the disruptions uh, caused last year. But if we are talking about getting it back onto a sustainable path, I think ultimately we will have to think about um, not just the current revival, uh, which obviously we are putting a lot of effort into getting the fiscal, monetary, and other measures to revive the economy for the for now. But I think ultimately it will depend on doing the following. First of all, we need to do the structural changes here in India. And we have, you know, um, 
been a country that has been very much into doing life site structural reforms throughout this phase. I mean, most countries in the world would have focused only on the demand side. We have been very much uh, focused on also doing supply side measures. Uh, and virtually every week or two weeks, you will see a new sector being opened up. Uh, the councillor mentioned, of course, the current sector, but in fact, we have done major reforms in the IT sector and the BPO sector recently. We have opened up our geospatial and IT sector and many other sectors that we, we can we can open up the uh, will to um, because we want to be a part of the global supply chains. We want to trade with the rest of the world. And, um, you know, everybody knows about the fact that India is the big pharmaceuticals hub now. And we want to also participate in providing those vaccines to the rest of the world. It's true that because of our current needs, we may have slowed down the exports, but we will be back uh, on screen uh, 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 anybody thinks. Thank you. Stay there. Don't go anywhere. I'm now going to come to my guest with me uh, on stage. And while, while you can see everyone there, I'll just introduce uh, the president of the CBI, also founder and chair of Cobra Beer, Lord Karen Bilmoria. He'll be speaking with me in just a moment. And you can also see on, on screen there the managing director of BlackRock, Niraj Seth, coming to us from Singapore. Give us a wave. We've also got the Vice Chair of uh, EY, Srinivasa Rao, and we'll be with you in just a moment. Let's come now to, to some questions back in the UK, Lord Bill Moria. You listened to the Chancellor's um, interview there. As an entrepreneur who has significant exposure to both the public sector as well as, uh, as, as what it's like to, to grow a business, can you tell me, first of all, what's your view on how the government's reacted to the pandemics across the world? Yeah, firstly, many congratulations to Manoj and all his team for what you're doing for the India Global Forum. It's outstanding. And the Chancellor, of course, Rishi, was, as usual, very, very impressive, uh, very clear. I agreed with everything that he said. And the reality is this. I was privileged to chair the B7, which is the premier business organizations of the G7 countries, and in my role as president of the Confederation of British Industry, the CBI, our sister organization, the CII, and of course this year at the G7 we had South Korea, Australia, South Africa, and India at the table, and of course Business Europe. And you asked Rishi about Europe. Well, I say this. We have met, we've left the European Union, but we will never, ever leave Europe. And the CBI continues to be a member of Business Europe. And so Europe was at the table as well. And we had some fantastic discussions, but Two things stood out for me. One was Dr. Ngozi, the new Director General of the WTO. She was so impressive and she made some very stark points. One, the WTO needs reform. One of our participants said it's in the last chance saloon. We need to roll back the protectionism around the world. And India's for it, the UK's for it, for free trade, multilateral trade and bilateral. The Charter said we want to enhance our trading partnership with India, double the trade over the next decade. And that's Brilliant. But Dr. Ngozi said that the inequalities in the world when it comes to vaccines, Africa is an example, 1.4 billion people, 17% of the world's population only has 0.15% of the vaccine manufacturing capability. And India, my friend Cyrus and other Poonawala, the owners of the Serum Institute of India, the largest vaccine manufacturers in the world. Look at the potential over there. The next point was made very powerfully by Dr. Geeta Gopinath, who spoke to us in, at the B7, the chief economist of the IMF. And she said the recovery from this pandemic around the world is going to be very unequal. You will have those countries, like the United Kingdom, that have provided phenomenal support to their businesses and to their economy. So thanks to Rishi, we've had 400 billion pounds. Now, by absolute terms, per capita terms, that's one of the highest levels of support given by any country to its businesses and to its economy. That will enable us to be like a coiled spring, as Andy Haldane, the recently retired chief economist of the Bank of England said, we're like a coiled spring. But very, Sanjeev made a very important point about the supply side. That's subject to supply side support being there. And from everything Rishi said, it is there. So we can bounce back. We're already seeing the bounce back. My own business, Cobra Beer, we supply 7,000 restaurants. They've been shut for the vast majority of the last 15 months. We're already seeing, since indoor dining opened up in the middle of May, how much the economy and our business is reviving. 
The second reason Dr. Gopinath said there will be inequality in the rebound is vaccinations. There are countries like the UK where we are ahead of the game. We are vaccinating at speed with huge proportions of our population already vaccinated, soon to be fully protected. On the other hand, there are countries that have not even vaccinated or hardly vaccinated anyone. So if you have a combination of economic support and vaccinations, we'll be able to rebound very, very quickly. And I'm very optimistic on the UK's prospect and, and of course, the UK-India prospects. It's such a hard balance, isn't it? Because on the one hand, you can see the arguments about wanting to vaccinate children down to the age of 12, as they're doing in the US, as I know they want to do in the UK. I, I personally, I've just had one child's school closed yet again. It doesn't work, right? We have to balance the health side with the economic side. That's the, the point that you and so many others are making. But how do you actually do that when the vaccine supply, as I heard from, um, from Adar Punwala this morning, it's going to take a few more months to get back to, to exporting to the world. Well, the reality is it's very noble and good that at the G7, uh, the United States and the UK, 400 million doses, 100 million surplus doses that we'll be supplying to the rest of the world and a commitment for a billion doses. But what's the reality? The world needs 11 billion doses. And the IMF has produced a fantastic report where if the world, particularly the G7, G20 countries, invest and it's tens of billions of dollars, to really ramp up the production very, very quickly and make sure these vaccines are around the world. As Rishi said, we're not safe until everyone is safe. And that's got to be a priority that we've got to do that. But it's three things when, on the health side. One is vaccinations. Second one is testing. The uh, access to lateral flow, affordable, rapid tests, if they use properly and you test regularly, are very effective. And the third thing people don't talk about enough is therapeutics repurpose therapeutics. We've got a therapeutics task force here in the UK. If that same effort and urgency is put into therapeutics, there are drugs like ivermectin, an anti-parasite drug that has shown huge promise in countries like South Africa, even in India. There are doctors that are using ivermectin with great effectiveness. Those trials need to be speeded up because once you have repurposed therapeutics that can, in effect, almost cure you from COVID, that's so powerful. And the combination of all three things, then we can beat this wretched virus. Thank you. So we'll, we'll come to our panel in just a moment. Let me just see, you mentioned one interesting innovation. Anything else you've seen from governments or private sector in, in the reactions to survive the challenges posed by the pandemic? There are many words that come out of this pandemic, and I, mean, I could go on for a long time. One is resilience that we, we've heard. The other one is agility and adoptability. Uh, Satya Nadella, who, who went to the, I went to the Hyderabad Public School, one of the schools I attended. He's an alumnus of Hyderabad Public School and now the chairman of Microsoft, and he said last, in May last year, he said in two months we've adopted technology that would normally take two years. The network effects of the technology is phenomenal, that we can do this conference now on a hybrid basis. That is very powerful going forward. The resilience of business has been great, but what to me has stood out is the collaboration. All that Rishi has spoken about, we've done that together. The CBI working with the government and the government listening to the needs of business and that is how the 400 billion pounds has been provided. The furlough scheme, what an innovative scheme. 100% government guaranteed loans. Those sort of supports that did not exist before that we've been able to innovate at speed with government and business working together. And the, at the point about the strategy, I think this is the time when we as countries, the UK and India, need to look long term. And I love the fact we've got an enhanced partnership for the next decade. At the CBI, we've just launched a new economic strategy for the UK over the next decade called Seize the Moment. And we've got six pillars. And we quantified it, that if we, it's climate change, it's innovation, it's global Britain and trading, 700 billion pounds to be added to our GDP. And one of them is clusters. That means making the most of clusters, like Cambridge University, with its tech cluster, the university at its heart, and now a bioscience, a life science cluster, AstraZeneca, partnered with Oxford, Swedish-British company, where are they headquartered? Cambridge. And then you team up with the Serum Institute of India, and you've got a global partnership and a UK-India partnership. So that's the power of this leveling up term that the government talks about, spreading prosperity throughout the regions of the UK and in turn also partnering with a country like India. That's the future. That's really powerful. That's going to create jobs. That's going to create innovation. That's going to be research. We need to invest much more in research and development. We only invest 1.7% of GDP in this country, 
America and Japan and, and Germany, 2.8%, Israel, 4%. Just imagine if we spent one more percent, an extra 20 billion pounds a year on R&D and innovation. We're so good anyway, we'd be even better. Lots to respond to there. Stay there. Don't go anywhere. Uh, let's go to our, our panelists over in, uh, in Singapore. So I'd love to hear, we've heard from the Chancellor of the UK, we've heard from the Principal Economic Advisor to the Government in India, talk about how their governments have responded, reacted to the financial and economic challenges posed. So as, leader, as a leader from the private sector, what's your initial reaction to what you've heard? So Niraj, Seth from Singapore. Sure, no, I'm happy to go first on that. I think there's certainly a, a lot has been done over the course of last uh, 15 to 16 months from the government in India in terms of reacting and trying to solve for the problem. But if I take a step back and try to sequence it and think about the future, I think the immediate still needs to be very much around more vaccinations, more vaccinations and more vaccinations in order to actually prepare the economy for reopening. Once you prepare, then it's a question around what do we need to actually jumpstart the economy and obviously avoid minimi minimal economic scarring from the shock that we have seen over the course of last 15 months and more so in the second wave, I would argue, than the first wave. And these are, again, factors which will matter for the next five and ten years. And then the third part is, or in third horizon, is something actually Sanjeev touched on in terms of the structural reform, supply side reform, thinking about the basics of what the world, the investors want to see to unlock the long-term growth potential. India has the benefit of one of the youngest demographics. The world is going through a shift when we think about geopolitics, the supply chain. There is a space for India to actually step in and provide a solution. Now, the question is, what will it take? And I would argue the reforms around land, labor, capital markets, I think they will be critical alongside the industry sector changes that we are observing in order to unlock that long-term potential growth. Because going back to your original question, do we see that 8% or higher growth in India? I actually think it's possible if we see the structural reforms coming alongside the near and mid-term focus on jump-starting the economy. So certainly something that global investors are very keenly focused on and watching. Srinivasa, what would you say to that question? Um, it's like the, the reality, and all of us uh, are very cognizant of it, is uh, the unprecedented state of ambiguity that we are in um, and the expression of agility that we've seen from governments um, I think has been uh, people working at their absolute best potential, best capacity with limited vision and with a multiplicity of undefined or underdefined variables. So I think agility to me almost uh, stands out as um, you know, the feature that we've seen on demonstration the last 15 months. And I don't think we are at a place where we can turn the page and expect to see a very well crystallized blueprint of recovery yet. So it's still going to have those agile energies and dynamics underneath that. Um, just from a private sector stand, uh, point of view, and if I may, providing uh, a frame of reference from a recent global confidence survey that we ran, a global capital confidence survey that we ran at EY, which included 2,400 CXOs of the largest companies in the world. Um, the, the tone, uh, the tenor of uh, positivism that we are drawing, for the most part, it's not overwhelmingly so. But uh, we were expecting a more mixed bag, but uh, we're seeing some very affirmistic uh, statements around positivism, the focus on strategy reviews and strategy refreshes, and the whole thrust on productivity um, as uh, you know, factors that many of these companies are seized uh, of their importance in the current state. So if you put all of this together and try and weave a common strand across them, 
uh, the unprecedented ambiguity, the continued activism around agility, and how the private sector is reacting to it overall, I'm inclined to paint a very sanguine picture of what we've done, what our governments have done in this uh, in the circumstances that none of us would have even imagined uh, 15 or 16 months back. So I do have a sanguine view, I must admit, on the state of affairs today. Thank you. We are trying to be as inclusive as possible. We've been sent a question by a viewer in Singapore. I'd love to get Sanjeev's view on this question. Let's hear now from Babita Abakar. International law firm CMS. So my question is, countries across the world have been battling COVID-19 and have had to work on economic recovery. As India is actively working on ramping up sectors such as manufacturing and agriculture, and also seeking to achieve PM Modi's goal of an Admanir Bharat, which is an independent Bharat, independent India. How do you see the nation playing a meaningful role within the global economy? Sanjeev, do you want to respond to that? Yes, I, I uh, couldn't hear uh, entirely clearly, but I think it was related to uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat and uh, That's the right. whole how, idea how the nation it. can play a meaningful role in the global economy, exactly. Yeah. So I think, first of all, um, the term Atmanirbhar Bharat, uh, which is often uh, um, translated as self-reliant and uh, translated into English, uh, I think very often people tend to misunderstand uh, it as some sort of a return to uh, a, a socialist era idea of uh, sort of an inward looking economy. That is not at all the case. We're not trying to create, uh, go back to some sort of a 1950s style uh, import substitution model. Atmanirbhar Bharat literally means being resilient based on, by leveraging your own strengths, um, internal strength. That's what it means. And um, it is still an idea of trying to close our borders in any way. Far from it, much of the effort is tuned towards building up local capacities in order to participate in global supply chains. So far from uh, being a sort of inward looking, it is really an attempt to sort of leverage India's strength to look outwards. Um, so let me illustrate the point. Uh, it's always best to illustrate the point. <clears throat> By now, everybody knows that we have one of the largest pharmaceutical um, sectors in the world here in India. It's very competitive uh, and, um, you know, uh, and much of it is export oriented. However, uh, one of the things we noticed during this period um, over the last 18 months, the sector was uh, very prone to shocks from single source foreign um, inputs. And the result was that, you know, if for whatever reason the supply chain breaks down, if this thing stops, then this, this particular sector suddenly stalled. So what we are doing is, finding ways of creating either multiple foreign sources or from finding a way of creating domestic sources for these inputs so that the resilience of this highly competitive export sector can be maintained irrespective of the shocks we get hit by. So I think that's a quite a different way of thinking about it rather than to think of some sort of written import substitute path, as that's what we're trying to do. And of course, if you see the various other policies we are putting in place and read over the last one year, you'll see it all makes, makes sense. Because first of all, we've done a whole bunch of reforms in the factory markets. I mean, labor reforms are getting done. We are, we are digitalize, digitizing our land records. Um, we, uh, we are introducing all kinds of sectoral um, uh, reforms. I, I mentioned earlier in the ITBPO sector or entire sectors being opened up. Um, and uh, as a result of that, uh, we are getting a response. By the way, we're getting a record foreign direct investment flowing into India. And uh, we intend to leverage this uh, even further uh, going ahead. So just so that everybody understands, Atman Edward Bharat is not a return to some uh, isolationism. Um, we have, in fact, one of our uh, uh, very successful um, uh, policies of the uh, you have something called the Production Linked Incentive Scheme, PLI scheme, where we have taken a few uh, sort of target sectors in order to ramp them up 
so that we can participate in global supply chain. And it has been very successful in things related relating to um, the electronic sector. You know, entire factories are getting relocated to India, and so you know, it's so so it's not just in services, but in you know, hardcore manufacturing. We are seeing a lot of the impact of uh, this new strategy. Thank you. So let me come back to my guest here on stage with me, Lord Bill Moria. Debt has been one of the biggest issues that we've seen uh, around the the response to the pandemic, the government global debt, I think, has increased by around $25 trillion. I mean, these are enormous numbers, right, in 2020. Global debt to GDP ratio hitting 350% and above. Do you think the government and the private sector have dug themselves into a hole here? Well, I just want to follow up on what Sanjeev just said. It's very important to see that when you talk about independent India, it's the more India enhances its capability and its excellence in every aspect, whether it's service or manufacturing, the more attractive India is to inward investment and the more competitive India is to exporting as well. So it's a benefit to India and it's a benefit to the global economy. What better example than vaccines? The Serum Institute of India, two out of every three children in the world are vaccinated by their vaccines before the pandemic, but they were not exporting the vaccines to countries like the UK. Now, in this pandemic, the Serum Institute of India has been exporting, including to the UK. So the world has seen the capability of India, and that's going to enhance the capability going forward, to the extent that they're opening up an office here in the UK for global uh, exports. So that is what capability enhancement can do. It opens India up even more to the global. And inward investment. I'm so proud of this country, the UK. 1% of the world's population, the latest figures have just come out, with the second largest recipient of inward investment in the world. I mean, that's fantastic. It's very important that we focus on investment in each other's countries, and India is investing a huge amount in the UK. When it comes to debt, at the end of the Second World War in the UK, debt to GDP went up to 250%. 250%. We're at about 100% now. It is high, but I'm very convinced the way out of the debt, the best way, is not to increase taxes, is not to have austerity, but to encourage investment and encourage growth, because that creates jobs, and the jobs then create the taxes that pay down the debt. So we've got to encourage investment and encourage growth, and that's what we're doing here in the UK. And, and India is doing exactly the same. In the Indian budget, we had an event with the CII, our sister organization, and it very clearly, a senior Indian government official and the CII said, we did not increase taxes in the February budget in India because businesses have suffered so much, and we don't want to stifle the recovery. Luckily, Rishi Sunak listened. And our Indian origin chancellor here has not increased taxes now. Maybe they'll increase in the future in two years' time. But we can't stifle the recovery. We've got to encourage growth and investment. Thank you. Niraj, would you, would you agree with that as well in terms of how to, how to encourage growth and investment? I would totally agree. I think given the shock to the system and the fact that you have the fiscal financing needs going up at the same time everywhere in the world, it has not happened in the last 50 years. And looking forward, coming out of the shock, coming out of the pandemic, jump-starting the economies, if anything requires more of a fiscal push and not less, more of a supportive policy and not less. And if you do get growth back, the ability to grow out of debt is very, very possible for obviously a lot of the high-performing economies. And the last thing I think it matters is it's not just the debt to GDP which is critical. It's also the serviceability of debt that's important. So I think looking at that and where the cost of debt in general, especially in the developed markets, I don't see that as a concern as long as, long as we are able to get back on the growth track in this world. Srinivasa, do you want to respond to that and tell me if you have any concerns about inflation as well? Yeah, so I, I actually believe that the deleveraging um, is going to be quite a complex affair. Um, and um, some of the traditional fiscal theorems, and I think uh, this was just referred to around um, the fiscal and revenue deficits and such, some of the, now I might say, the old world theorems uh, need to be fully examined and reset for the circumstances that we are in. Um, I do very much see uh, inflationary trends. Uh, I think all of us are across uh, across the world. And, um, you know, the kind of debt that has been put into households, 
uh, with the you know with the relaxed monetary policy that has had to be employed. Um, there's a 10% growth in household debt uh, over the last uh, four quarters, and um, I think the uh, while there is an overall prognosis of inflation which seems utterly logical and reasonable. Uh, the one safeguard I think we have this time compared to previous implosions around uh, inflationary patterns is I think there is a higher degree of awareness, intelligence, knowledge, know-how and skill around how to manage the inflation. Mm. It's not as raw and primal a topic as it was 50 years back or 70 years back. I think there's a, an acquired skill of the last few decades that leaves the governments and us in the private sector in a better place to navigate uh, these inflationary trends and tame them over time. But that taming is going to take time. It's not something that could happen in a rapid hurry. Okay, thank you very much. I want to just bring my guests up to say a massive thank you to all of you for joining us here at India Global Forum. If you